Can we walk this road together? I can't travel it alone. I need someone beside me to help me find my way back home. Hello, this is Dan Prince, an executive director of the Wasma Center for Human Rights in Boise with Adam Thompson. Hello. Welcome to Voices of Idaho. Today we're talking with Alana Rubel, Idaho legislator. It's got to be a challenge. <laughs> now more than ever. <laughs> what do you think is defining your term in office? Um, boy, well, I, you know, I, I hope it's... Um... It's a healthy mixture of idealism and pursuing the big goals, but practicality and actually getting things done um, and, you know, work, working with the folks I need to work with and doing the work that it takes to actually get results so I'm not just shouting into a void. You know, so much of what we talk about in the Wasmus Center programming revolves around our concept of the spiral of injustice, that how do we identify the other within our community, those who have been marginalized or demeaned or pushed to the edges? And do we recognize the levels of injustice in which we find that the other has been targeted? Yeah. Is there a story that you would bring to us today regarding the spiral? Yeah, I was thinking about that. And uh, well, I guess I want to, you know, preface this and the whole notion of upstanders, because um, this was always a very big deal in my family. My family's Jewish. They came here fleeing the Holocaust. At least my mother's side did. My father's side came fleeing pogroms. Um, but uh, the Holocaust really played large in my upbringing. We saw a lot of movies and documentaries, and I was very aware of it from a very early age. And uh, my grandfather would always talk a lot about it, and he would say that, you know, people were barking up the wrong tree talking about Hitler, that Hitler was a sideshow. That was not the main <laughs> headline here, um, that he was just an easy scapegoat for humanity. And the real story were the millions of people who went along with him and made it all possible. And that's where we should be focusing our concern and really analyzing how did that become possible? Because he always said, you know, I don't know if Hitler ever killed a single person. It's like, I don't know if he ever personally pulled the trigger on killing yeah. one single person. Um, but he was able to kill six million people um, through the inaction and, you know, complicitness of others. Um, and that really the whole Holocaust was a story of what mankind is capable of. Mm -hmm. And the fact that, you know, in any given situation, if it's the easiest thing to do, then 90% of people will go along with that. Um, he also told me the story of the Milgram study and how the overwhelming majority of people would just keep pushing the button until they thought they were killing somebody, you know, rather than actually stand up and do the hard work of, of, of confronting them. Um, and so he always really drilled into me that it was, you know, you don't want to be like most people. You, you know, their number one goal in life is to not be like the 90% of people that will just go along, that your moral goal in life is to be, even if it's a tiny fringe, that fringe that will be the upstander. Um, so that's kind of the, the background of how I've always approached, you know, my moral framework in life. Um, and when I was marrying somebody, that was my litmus test is, you know, I got lucky and I found somebody who was good looking and you know, brilliant and <laughs> nice in addition to everything else. But my, my litmus test was always, would he be a person that I truly believe in my heart would have been an upstander, would have been in the resistance, you know, in the Second World War, would have been one of the people in the Milgram study who didn't keep pushing the button. Um, and I feel like he is that person, but that was how I would look at people I would date and look at as serious. Um, but the story that I guess I thought of personally um, was one when I was, I think, 16 years old, living in Toronto, Canada, um, and living in kind of a Jewish part of town. And I'd always heard these stories of discrimination, but I always thought those were the bad old days and that people had gotten over that. And it certainly wasn't anything that I had ever experienced at that point. I thought it was something in the, in the history books at that point. Um, but one day I was... Um, I was going to prom and I lived, you know, single mother. We didn't have a car. My date was 16, didn't have a car. So I was taking the city bus to prom. Uh, so there it was an evening on a Saturday evening. And I'm wearing my white prom dress, uh, all dressed up, <laughs> sitting on the city bus, getting right into the subway station to ride downtown and get to prom. Um, and there were these kids on the bus um, that looked at me and I guess, you know, I'm, I guess I must be very obviously Jewish looking or whatever. And they, they just started saying, wow, look at the, look at the little Jewish girl there all dressed up to, for prom. It's like, you know, and, and it's like, 
Let's see if we can F up her dress. You know, I bet, wouldn't she be freaked out if we, look, I got a Coke here. Why don't I just go dump my Coke on her prom dress? You know, they, and then and then they were sort of joking back and forth. It's like, well, maybe Bob should do it because he's got a cherry slushy, and, you know, wouldn't that look funny on her dress? And they were just, and I was terrified because, well, for the very practical purpose that I was thinking like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen to me if these people actually come and dump all their drinks on my white dress on my way to prom? I'll have to go home, skip prom, what will I tell my date? There were no cell phones in those days. Um, but obviously, it was, a, it was a terrifying and very painful experience. And it was kind of a, wow, this, this isn't something that's in the history books. This is apparently something that can happen in an enlightened city with even a large Jewish population like Toronto. Um, but the other thing that struck me about the experience was there were other people on the bus. Not a lot, but there were probably four or five other people sitting on the bus as well um, who did nothing and who just were sort of watching it and and just waiting to see what would happen. They seemed interested in a kind of a, oh, let's see how this plays out. But there really wasn't anybody that intervened. Um, and again, this sort of flashed me back. I'm like, wow, my grandfather was right. <laughs> you know, this is this is too dominant a pattern with people that they will just sit here and not do anything. And I was just racking my brains of like, what do I do? You know, I'm like, I don't want to give them the satisfaction of crying or, or fleeing or running. You know, I kind of wanted to run up to the bus driver and I thought about that a lot. And I'm like, well, would that just give them satisfaction feeling that they'd won? Um, and I was just trying to sit there staring ahead, fighting back tears and trying to figure out how to deal with the situation. Uh, and in the end, finally, you know, they did not dump anything on me, I'm happy to say. Um, but I was so terrified. I, I finally, at the end, I went up and just sat at the front, probably until the bus was about ready to leave the station again. I mean, I sat there for 20 minutes after everybody had left the bus because I was so afraid they would waylay me <laughs> as soon as I got off. Um, but it really stuck with me. And again, the silence of people, at least as much as the actions of my tormentors. It's oftentimes in our programming, we will talk in terms that any one of us, all of us, at some moment we've been the other, where we become the target. Mm -hmm. And the recognition that it can happen in so many different ways right. at so many different times. This is Eva Wilson's What It Is. Freedom, what a beautiful word. Freedom to be me, freedom to express my opinions, I have so much while others have little. I have the right to live, to breathe, to just be free. Freedom. What a bold word. Free to run, free to love, heart and soul. No worries. Happiness is no stranger. Free to feel, free to speak. Nothing could be better than to be so free. Freedom. Seems to soar like a hatchling just barely finding its wings. Free to choose, free to climb higher. I crash and fall. I learn and I grow because I am free. From your own family story, what now do you feel is the legacy you're giving to your children? What becomes the story that is shared for a new generation? Well, you know, I certainly hope that I've carried on my grandfather's emphasis that um, you don't be one of the crowd. Um, it's much more important to be able to live with yourself and feel like you always did the right thing. And if that means you're standing up against, you know, 50, 100 people and the only voice in a room, be happy. That's where you want to be. Um, and I hope that I've demonstrated that. I mean, that certainly has been um, a guiding force for why I got into public office. Um, it's guided many of the initiatives that I've taken on in, in public office. Um, the first bill I, I passed was an anti-bullying bill um, that was, that was you know, brought on behalf of some, some parents that had come to me and told me about what had happened to their, their children and in some cases had been driven to suicide or suicide attempts by you know, homophobia and other persecution in the schools. Um, and so that really spoke to me and I was like, I'm going to make this happen or else. Um, and, you know, I've sponsored Add the Words every year that I've been there. Um, pretty much, you know, I, I can't resist the cause where That's I right. see there's a situation where there is um, an oppressed group that I feel needs somebody to speak up and stand up for them. And I really hope that my kids see that. They know that I'm doing it. They, they hear about it nonstop at home over the dinner table. And so I certainly hope they, they do that in their own lives. What role do you see that schools play in this? Well, I think the, the same role that all humanity plays, um, but perhaps a, a heightened role for schools because they are the guardians of our children. They have them more hours of the day often than parents do. 
um, and uh, you know they're present and and in charge of a very potentially fraught situation. Um, kids are still learning the parameters and can be really rough on each other. Um, and the schools are sort of the first line of seeing what happens and being in an empowered position to uh, uh, to address it. Um, so I do think there is um, perhaps a heightened burden even on schools to keep an eye out and make sure that they are really vigilant in in protecting against children suffering unduly at each other's hands at an early age. Well, we're in an environment surrounded by the words etched into the stone of the Idaho Anne Frank Human Rights Memorial. Is there a particular quote that speaks to you? Yeah, there is. The one that I picked um, was a quote from Dr. Chaim Gennott. Um, and I'll just read it. It says, uh, Dear teacher, I am a survivor of a concentration camp. My eyes saw what no person should witness. Gas chambers built by learned engineers, children poisoned by educated physicians, infants killed by trained nurses, women and babies shot and killed by high school and college graduates. So I am suspicious of education. My request is, help your students to become human. Your efforts must never produce learned monsters, skilled psychopaths, or educated Eichmanns. Reading, writing, and arithmetic are only important if they serve to make our children more humane. Um, and that really spoke to me. I, you know, I'm an enormous advocate of education. You know, I, I, I hope all my kids get degrees and postgraduate degrees and all that. But I think it's really um, important to remember that none of that matters. Your titles don't matter. How much money you make matter. Uh, your degrees don't matter. Um, if you're not an upstander, if you're not a good person at the end of the day working um, to better the world, then it's, in my mind, completely irrelevant what you know, what other achievements you can rack up. And I think people can get far too distracted in pursuing those um, peripheral feathers in their cap and, and lose the sight of what really matters. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for Voices of Idaho today with Alana Rubel. It's why we will continue to echo, not in our town, not in our state, Idaho is too, too great, great for, for hate. hate. With you right here beside me, we'll find our home with peace again. Nineteen ninety five, there's an exhibit traveling the United States. The then executive director of the Human Rights Commission, Marilyn Schuler, was contacted, did we want to bring this exhibit to Boise? And Frank in the world. It was a pricey exhibit, so Marilyn did what we all do in nonprofit work. She reached out and fundraised, meeting with businesses, community leaders, individuals, to bring the exhibit to town for one month in nineteen ninety five. In that month's time, 40,000 people came to the exhibit. Obviously, something in Anne Frank's story resonated. Hi there. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Wasmus Center podcast. The clip you just heard is from a new type of episode where Dan and I will be talking about specific aspects of the Wasmus Center. The first episode of this type will be premiering next Monday, September 16th, where we talk about the history and necessity of the Anne Frank Human Rights Memorial. Big thank you to Alana Rubel for coming on the podcast this week and telling your story. The Voices of Idaho is created by Dan Prenzing and produced and edited by me, Adam Thompson. Thanks. See you next week.